Hello and welcome to the Can't Make This Up History Podcast. I am your host, Kevin. Well, I hope you are all safe and healthy uh, wherever you are in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, The world has changed since my last episode. Um, I know for me, uh, that means working from home. That means living in a state, I'm here in Ohio, uh, where most businesses are shut down, uh, restaurants, um, most retail. Um, so the world has changed significantly, and as, as I'm sure it has uh, for you as well. Um, so I just wanted to give you my, my best wishes, and uh, I wanted to share some thoughts that uh, I put this on my uh, personal Facebook, but they seem applicable here. So um, I just wanted to give you, if I may, a historian's perspective to all this. As this becomes the significant global event uh, that it has, uh, researchers a generation or two from now, when our memories of this have faded or are gone entirely, will try to assemble the story of what we are all living right now from the pieces that we leave behind. Anyone who's done any kind of uh, historical research knows what I'm talking about. I would ask you to consider journaling your experience of the COVID-19 pandemic. You may not feel like anyone will ever want to read about your time holed up during quarantine, but they will. Uh, At a minimum, uh, your grandchildren will want to know what you were doing when they reach an age where they become curious about the family history. But speaking more broadly, historians writing history of the 2020 pandemic will comb through the archives. Um, They'll want to learn what Trump did and Congress and Macron and Conte. But they're also going to want to know how regular people live during this time. They will write economic histories and they'll want to know how uh, these decisions have affected labor and laborers. They'll write social histories and they'll want to know how it affected families, how it affected children. Wherever you live, every one of our counties will write histories for their tricentennial and then later on their quadricentennial celebrations, and they'll want to know what their people were doing during the great pandemic. There will be special history projects created just to compile our records and archive them, as there will be oral history projects later on to preserve our memories. I've done this kind of research before, and and there's nothing worse than knowing significant events were happening but you see this gigantic void in the records where no one bothered to write anything down. One thing that we can all do is leave something for posterity uh, so that they remember what this was like for everyday folks like ourselves. So once again, I just want to say best wishes to you wherever you are. We will get through this. I know you hear that all the time, but we will. In the meantime, I hope that this little podcast can at least give you something to do during your quarantine hours and and at least brighten your day a little bit. So let's move on to today's topic. When you think of spies, what comes to mind? Daniel Craig dressed in a tuxedo ordering a martini shaken, not stirred? Or perhaps Tom Cruise dangling from a wire in a pressure-sensitive room? Today on the podcast, we are talking about the slightly less dramatic but just as incredible history of real-world espionage. My guest today is BBC security correspondent Gordon Carrera. Gordon studied modern history at Oxford and U.S. foreign policy at Harvard before becoming a reporter, a 20-plus year career in which he has covered foreign affairs and security issues. He joins us today from the UK via Skype to discuss his latest book, Russians Among Us, Sleeper Cells, Ghost Stories, and the Hunt for Putin Spies which is an in-depth look at Russia's illegals program that survived the collapse of the Soviet Union and has evolved into Russia's high-tech foreign intelligence apparatus today. Now, on to the show. The You Can't Make This Up History Podcast Bringing you strange but true things from the past It's not the average history that you learned in school We're bringing you the heroes and bringing you the fools Gordon Carrera, thank you for coming on the podcast today. 
Well, thank you for having me on. Uh, well, uh, if you would uh, be so kind as to tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, uh, I understand that you have a long history of writing on the subjects of intelligence and espionage. Uh, I guess I do. Um, I've been um, working as a journalist um, for about a um, long time, about 25 years. And I guess essentially since so 9-11, since 2001, I've been focusing on intelligence and security issues. And for the past um, 16 years, been a security correspondent at the BBC, written um, some books on the subject, um, everything from kind of nuclear proliferation and efforts to stop it through a book on Britain's secret intelligence service, MI6, one on kind of cyber espionage, another on a Second World War operation involving pigeons, and more recently, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Russian spies, bit of a bit of a gear shift from pigeons to russian spies but the, the link is spying <laughs> uh, so what is it about spying that appeals to you what makes it so interesting well it's a good question i mean partly i think because it matters i think uh, i'm interested in the way in which spying um actually does uh, affect the world around us the big decisions that are taken decisions of war and peace the course of uh, the course of those wars um, the relationships between countries. But I also like the fact it involves often people at a very human individual level. Why do people spy? Why do they get involved in resistance groups? How are those spies stopped? It's the kind of, uh, what I find fascinating is the mix between the, that big picture stuff that really matters and the very human detail about spying and the people who get kind of involved in it and um, the kind of curious stories involving them. So for me, it's 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 that mix that um, that I've always found intriguing. Yeah, and it, it has led you to write about some very compelling subjects in your book. Um, the book we're going to talk about today is uh, Russians Among Us, Sleeper Cells, Ghost Stories, and the Hunt for Putin Spies. So if you could um, start, I guess, by uh, starting your history with uh, 1991. Uh, on paper, the Soviet Union dissolved, the intelligence apparatus, the KGB, dissolved. But uh, what was the reality? Well, that's, I, I thought it was a really interesting moment to start, partly because everyone talks now, well, ask the question, are we in a new Cold War? Um, and, and the answer I found is not quite. Um, um, because it's different. Um, but the best place to understand what's different and what's the same is certainly to go back to 1991 and that moment, because um, you get a sense of how far the spying game stopped, didn't stop, and how it changed by starting at that point. And I mean, one of the kind of anecdotes I start the book with is is a, a British MI6 officer who's in Moscow in when the coup happens in 1991. And the coup is when a a hard line group try and kind of preserve the Soviet Union, fearing it's about to collapse and launch a coup against Mikhail Gorbachev. And um, um, there's this brief moment where this MI6 officer realizes that surveillance has disappeared from him and that the KGB teams who are normally trailing him around Moscow for the first time are, are not there. And he's kind of thinking what's going on. And then the next day he realized they've been pulled back as part of this coup um, but then the remarkable thing is there's three days of chaos and then the coup collapses and then three days later the surveillance team are back on him as if nothing has happened <laughs> and that's a little anecdote which just gives a sense of um, on the surface lots of things can change but actually the spying game went on almost almost uninterrupted uh, from the moment that the cold war comes to an end um, but it does change, but it basically both sides, particularly the spies on both sides, um, um, keep it going for lots of reasons. You deal a lot with um, espionage currently, but, uh, but a lot of the things going on now have ties to the Soviet Union prior to 1991. Mm. Uh, and, and, and some of that is assets that were put into uh, foreign countries um during the time of the soviet union so if you could tell us um you know what yeah. was the soviet sleeper program or illegals as they called them well this is um this is the the kind of heart of my book and the bit i've always found fascinating and um for anyone who's watched the tv series the americans set in the cold war in the 80s mm -hmm. this will be very familiar because this is basically the the the, the real story which inspired that fiction um, the illegals program run by directorate S of the KGB 
um, basically put in um, sleepers in other countries. Now, lots of countries have what they call legal spies, and these are uh, operate under, for instance, diplomatic cover. So you'll um, be operating out of an embassy. Um, and, and the Russians and, and lots of countries use spies who work under non-official cover. So you might be pretending to be a businessman or someone else. And in the Russian terminology, these are called illegals um, because they don't have legal diplomatic cover. But where the US and the UK might send a, a businessman to Russia to, 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 to do some spying and use the cover of being a businessman when in fact they're a CIA or an MI6 officer, Russia has a whole nother level to the program, which is where, particularly in the Cold War, they took people who were Russians and they trained them to be Americans or Canadians or British. And they actually trained them to discard their true nationality and to become another nationality entirely and to take on a whole new identity. Often the identity um, in a kind of bizarre, macabre post process of a dead child, um, which was a process called tombstoning, because they sometimes went around the, the tombstones, the gravestones in cemeteries to find the names of dead children. And then uh, in the West, and then give those identities, create identities for their own spies to then go back into the West and live uh, as Westerners and therefore be able to kind of burrow deep into Western society. Now, these were sent out in the Cold War. They had, um, they were very successful in the 1930s and 1940s, stole um, atomic secrets in America, recruited the famous Cambridge spies in Britain like Kim Philby. And this program continued and Russia sent out some of these spies, you know, towards the end of the Cold War. And then when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, um, the spies sent out by the Soviet Union rather than Russia, um, they, they continued. Um, uh, and they were there actually spying for a different political system but they kept their allegiance to moscow and um these were some of the people i was fascinated by because they just kept going with their mission and it, it was a mission which they would be put into the west sometimes for decades um to build their cover and to to work their way deeper into american society particularly so they're kind of watching these uh, global events happening and and they're in the west and they're not really sure what's going on back back home are they no, and, and, and that was one particular couple who I was interested in. They adopted the names um, Donald Heathfield and Anne Foley, although their real names were Andrei Bezrukov and Elena Vavilova. And uh, they actually had gone in to the uh, program um, in the mid-80s. They'd then gone initially to Canada with the aim always of going to the U.S., but they were, um, as the Soviet Union kind of ended, as the flag went down in the Soviet Union, they were on a, a holiday in Buffalo, New York, and they watched the um, they watched the flag descend from the Soviet Union. And they, you know, Elena says she cried because, you know, this this thing she'd been sent to to work for this this all this institution suddenly she thought, well, what's happened? But actually, they decide to keep going and they keep going on their mission. And they still spend another seven, eight years before they actually in, in Canada and then a, in, in France before they finally make it um, to the U.S. To, to, to become deep cover illegals um, living in Boston. Now, um, their experience, um, what is the experience for an illegal like living? Uh, is it a James Bond type existence? No, and I mean, I think they, they you know, Andrei Bezrukov, Don, Donald Heathfield actually says, if you think it's like James Bond, you won't last, you know, very long, because it, it's not the drama of kind of breaking into a, you know, a, 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 a government building and stealing something from the safe. It's actually much, he, he describes it more like being a kind of almost an anthropologist, like being studying another culture. You have to study it and and slowly work your way in and i mean it's at times it's almost comic i mean one of the jobs he takes in canada is delivering diapers you know it's he starts a business with someone else called diapers direct which in which he you know he delivers you know he organizes for diapers to be delivered by van so it's not exactly glamorous james bond and yet all the time he's working on this long-term mission which is get the next job get deeper and eventually you know, eventually, he gets uh, gets to Harvard and goes to the Kennedy School of Government and is um, moving in his class with people who eventually become president of Mexico, people who, you know, join the U.S. military. You know, he starts to move in national security circles. And so slowly he works his way in uh, to American society and to those people who are potentially interesting to Moscow and where he can find out about them. But it's a long, slow process. And 
and and a strange one to kind of have to basically give up your normal identity and I, you know i find it fascinating you know he talks about having to kind of learn to to dream in in english and in a different language and you know one of the things his wife worries about is the moment of giving birth because they fear that actually when you're giving birth you'll suddenly cry out in your native language and you can't help it which would be russian it might give you away so they have to go through huge effort to think about how to to plan the process of giving birth to reduce those risks so there's an amazing mix of the kind of the day-to-day and the and the spy craft, you know, of sending back secret messages. Well, and and like you just alluded to with childbirth, they're they're running a marriage and having having yeah. a family and and living a living a quote unquote normal life on top of this. Yeah, and I that bit is also fascinating. I mean, in some illegals, with illegals were also sent out normally in the, in the Cold War, particularly as couples. Uh, and one of the reasons for that was the fear was if you sent out a single person, they might um, meet someone in the West then fall in love and then be faced with this dilemma about, you know, do you reveal to their secret? How can you keep it from someone you're married to? So they often sent out married couples. Um, sometimes those couple, those marriages were arranged by, by the KGB, although in, in the case of um, Heathfield and Foley, they were actually a couple at university who were kind of jointly recruited. And then you have the issue of children and um you know, it's interesting, but a lot of the illegals kind of wondered what to do about children because your children, when they're born, they think they're Canadian or American, you know, and they are effectively being told a lie by their parents as to the fact that their parents are really Russian spies. And there was always this dilemma for them, which is, you know, when do you tell your children? What do you tell your children? Do you tell them? Do you bring them up in the West? How much do you bring them up in kind of American values? It was a real tension and challenge. And that goes back to that really kind of interesting human story i found for, for for these people who were who were spies for moscow yeah that that is just fascinating um trying to understand how these people um coped with a life like this it, mm. completely fascinating um so these people are in incredibly deep how does the united states counterintelligence go about investigating people like mm. this well, one of the things uh, you know, I discover talking to people is that it's very hard to spot an illegal in the wild, as you might put it, to, to just find one by chance. Because the whole point is they are, you know, they're, they're not um, um, communicating, for instance, with the Russian embassy. They're not, you know, under uh, uh, using normal um, protocols. So just trying to kind of find one like that is almost impossible. So as is often the case in this world, it takes a spy to catch a spy. And the the reality is that the uh, FBI had recruited um, a Russian intelligence officer who was in the UN mission in New York in mid-1999 um, called Alexander Pataev. And he went back to Moscow to work in Directorate S in the department that ran the illegals in the Americas. And for a decade, he was there in the heart of Moscow taking huge risks, but feeding back intelligence to the US about the illegals and what it meant was that they were able to monitor this group of russian spies uh who were in america and for a decade effectively watch them learn about them try and keep them uh, away from any really sensitive secrets until eventually in 2010 um, they were arrested so it's a kind of remarkable operation in that way and and how long had they been living here by the well, it's a mix. So out of that group who were arrested in 2010, I mean, the, the uh, Heathfield and Foley had come in the late 80s. So they had done, you know, 20, 23 years, you know, they'd been operating undercover in Canada and uh, France as well. But m mm -hmm. most of that or more of that in, in the US. Some of the others had come, you know, a bit later. Um, there was another one called Juan Lazaro who'd been operating in kind of uh, Latin America as well since the 70s. Um, but uh, basically retired and had, had, had retired in New York from being an undercover uh, intelligence officer, but had stayed in, in New York because he'd married and had 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 uh, had had um, had a child in, in New York. So um, the, 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 there were different stages for these different intelligence officers. And then there was Anna Chapman, who'd uh, only arrived in New York a few months earlier, just before she was arrested, when this whole group were then rounded up in um, the summer of 2010. And uh, no, no cases of uh, where FBI agent moved next door. 
<laughs> going back to the TV series, well, I think I think actually there were in in, in the Murphy family in New Jersey. Um, the uh, it looks like the FBI was certainly on their street, keeping an eye on them, and um, they actually had you know the the, di- the the difference from the TV series is is they really did know who they were from the start and had them pretty carefully watched. So they had their homes wired, you know, with microphones in them to know what they were talking about and were able to kind of stake out the FBI were able to stake out some of the meetings the illegals were having, including on some occasions with each other or with people who were handing them money. And so they were pretty carefully watched, including by uh, people people on the on the same road as them. <laughs> um, so um you write that beginning in 1999, uh, Russia began to take a renewed interest in its foreign intelligence and overseas assets. Uh, why is that? So I, I, I do link a lot of this to um, Vladimir Putin's rise. And he becomes head of the FSB, then prime minister in 99, and then um, is appointed president uh, at the turn of the, of the millennium. So he uh he he after a year in which russian spies have have kept spying but have been on the back foot he basically turbocharges the spies spies are a kind of key part of his identity he's a former kgb officer himself he highly values the illegals he uses the fear that foreign spies are undermining russia to kind of solidify his hold but he also gives more impetus to russian spies who are operating abroad and basically kind of you know increases the resources given to them and that's a trend you see through his time in power that he kind of increasingly relies on and unleashes his spy services to do more and more in the west yeah um you you kind of write about his internal motivation um to the extent that we can we can understand it that as a kgb officer he's you know he feels that it's going to take a, a kgb officer to kind of maintain russia mm. that's right i think there is this so there is this mentality amongst those russian spies and former russian spies which is that firstly that they felt they'd lost the cold war um partly because the cia and others had subverted their country and you know had, had played games and then they fe- felt that the 1990s had been a decade of humiliation for russia um having been a superpower it was then um reduced to you know being almost a joke to um, uh, its economy collapsing um, to just a sense in which it wasn't, it was ignored by the US. And so Putin, one of his, I think, great desires was to restore Russia's power and the belief that a strong state could protect the motherland, as he would put it, and that strong spy services and a former KGB man would offer the kind of strength um, to do that and to end that humiliation. I think that that's an important theme throughout his his time in office. Now, you you had mentioned um, a few minutes ago uh, Anna Chapman, who was also uh, apprehended in, in 2010. Um, but what can you tell us about her? She's a she's a very unique case. Yeah, Anna Chapman is is a really interesting case because she is to me uh, she's uh, she's a sign of how Russian espionage was changing and how the illegals program was changing in the 2000s. So um, uh, I was talking earlier about the kind of family illegals, you know, who, who came to the to the West and took on a new identity and a new nationality. Anna Chapman was slightly different. She was a young woman who came first of all to the UK, who married someone in the UK and got a British passport and the British name, Chapman, but never actually hid the fact that she was Russian. And at some point during that time, it's thought, no one's absolutely sure, she was recruited by uh, Russia in the intelligence program, and she uh, eventually ends up in New York, in Manhattan. And it's a sign of the way the program has changed, because one of the different difficulties is, post, particularly post 9-11, post 2001, the, the ability to hide your identity is getting harder. 9-11 9-11 was obviously um, about terrorists coming into the US, but it led to new checks on identities. Basically, people wanted to know who was traveling, who they were. Um, there were more databases, the dots were going to be connected. 
um, people's identity was going to be resolved. There was going to be the ability to check who they were. That that was done for terrorism, but obviously had an implication on the spy world. And at the same time, you also have biometrics coming along where your fingerprints can be taken and your picture checked on a database. All of that, again, makes it harder to pretend to be someone you're not. Uh, and this is quite challenging for spies. And so one of the things you start to see uh, on the Russian side is they start to shift towards a different type of illegals. Um, and, they, and they're called by the FBI true name illegals because they're not actually hiding their uh, true name or their true nationality. But someone like Anna Chapman is 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 openly Russian, but she is still working, if you like, as an illegal um, um, for the Russian intelligence uh, authority, according to the to the FBI. And so she is being used in a different way. And she's younger and she's single. Uh, and so she can um, meet different people in a different context. And actually, she proved, I mean, she was seen as a, you know, slightly comic figure, particularly not comic, but, you know, seen in a lighthearted way, I would say, um, particularly because she was a kind of glamorous young woman. But actually, I think she was more interesting than we sometimes give her credit for, because uh, she was actually in, in maybe six, seven months that she spent in, in Manhattan, actually able to make great inroads in terms of meeting people, particularly men, and um, and actually getting to know people. And someone did say to me that if, if, if she hadn't been watched, if they hadn't known about her, she could have actually in the long run moved to quite influential positions. You know, someone in Russia said, well, you could imagine she was the type of person who could have married a congressman or, you know, someone very influential in Wall Street and then would have had access to kind of, you know, in, in the way the illegals always wanted to, to influential people, to the gossip, to understanding who's who, who's up, who's down, um, you know, who might be vulnerable to an approach by the Russian intelligence service. And so in that sense, Anna Chapman was was quite interesting as a, as a shift in the way uh, Russia was spying. Um, and uh, yeah, she certainly got a lot of newspaper headlines when the group of 10 illegals were arrested in 2010. Um, but she was also kind of interesting as, as part of that shift, I think. Um, now, she's kind of because she was part of a swap and, and sent back to Russia, if I remember, but mm. she's a, a, a bit of a celebrity there now isn't she yeah she was particularly when she came back she was the certainly the most famous of the illegals so you know the, the 10 were arrested by the fbi in the u.s and then swapped for four russians who'd been spying uh, allegedly spying for the for the west and were in jail in russia and um she so she got back to russia as, as part of that swap and within a few months she was at a kind of you know space launch and then she was doing some you know, kind of glamorous modeling shoots. Um, she hosted a TV show for a while, I think Secrets with Anna Chapman. Um, uh, she's got a bit quieter since then, actually. But she certainly um, used the celebrity of having been part of that spy swap in an interesting way, and in, not in the way you would have expected spies in the past to, to use it. But actually, some of the others, like um, the, the married couple I'm, I, I mentioned earlier, Heathfield and Foley, um, Bezrukov and Bavilova, also have appeared on Russian TV quite regularly, and even on chat shows, to talk about their life as a spy in the West. In one case, actually with someone who'd um, played a Russian in the TV drama The Americans. So that gives you some idea about kind of, you know, fact and fiction sometimes intermingling in this world of spies, which they often do. So it sounds like Russia kind of... Um takes uh, the Russian people take pride in in their espionage um, capabilities yeah I think that's right and I think Putin does and as Putin has 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 led a campaign to increase the pride in Russian spies and I think the the kind of people who have a positive view of Russian spies it's kind of doubled since nearly doubled since he came to power and 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 that's a kind of deliberate campaign and they've always done it back to the kind of role of the spies in the second world war when illegals were kind of fabled for their work against nazi germany so so these spies are, are an important part of popular culture and one of the things i write about in the book is how that meant the arrest in 2010 of anna chapman and the other illegals was actually a real blow to vladimir putin because um, he'd made a you know kind of um, he'd, he'd made a big thing about um these spies and illegals being great heroes and suddenly here they were arrested by the americans um, clearly under under watch by the Americans for 10 years, um, it was quite humiliating for him. It made him angry. And I think it also sparked a desire for revenge for that um, arrest in 2010 and the perceived humiliation, the, the exact thing which he felt he'd come into office to to expunge, to get rid of. 
Now, on the the subject of revenge, you you write quite a bit about the the willingness and and the lengths that Russian uh, Russia will go to assassinate defectors um, who who leave the spy service. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, that's right. I mean, I think it's it's worth understanding if you understand the way Russian view spies, the way in which they glorify their own spies, but also vilify and inspire a kind of hatred for the treachery of anyone who betrays Russia, you understand why they are willing to go to quite extreme lengths. Now, in the UK, we saw a former Russian security officer from the FSB, Alexander Litvinenko, poisoned with radioactive polonium in 2006 and killed. And then in 2018, in the UK, you see Sergei Skripal, poisoned with a chemical weapon with nerve agent. Now, he had been one of those four swapped for the illegals. Eight years after that swap, nearly eight years, you know, he is, you know, Russian spies allegedly come to the UK carrying a nerve agent and put it on his door handle to try and kill him and end up nearly killing him, but not quite, and his daughter, Yulia. That gives you some idea about how deeply ingrained the desire to get revenge on those Moscow seniors, traitors, is is inside that culture. Uh, and I think we need, we need to appreciate and understand that. I, I remember when uh, Theresa May uh, briefed Parliament um, about that in 2018. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and she pointed the finger very quickly at Russia. I don't think... Um, I, 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 it's a kind of a, a bizarre operation in some ways because two... Russian military intelligence officers came and um, were sprayed using a perfume bottle carrying carrying this nerve agent, Novichok, um, poison on Sergei Skripal's um, front door handle. And then when it was kind of exposed a few months later, they kind of were put on Russian TV famously to kind of say they'd only been in Salisbury to look at the famous spire of the cathedral, which I'm not sure many people believed but it was a sign of how far russia was willing to go and also of the fact that russia saw itself particularly since 2014 as already engaged in a kind of conflict with the west so while the west didn't necessarily see it as uh, see that um russia did russia russia thought there was a conflict and and you saw putin unleash his spies um whether it was agents you know trying to carry out poisoning or whether it was cyber spies trying to steal data or to manipulate public opinion you see that unleashed particularly from starting with 2014 which is when the crisis over ukraine and crimea really um, uh, really emerges you just uh, mentioned um you know cyber security and um the the issues related to the internet how has um the russian government really invested in in using um brand new technologies as part of uh, as part of their spy game i think they they have and they've understood better than others i think the way in which they can use technology um they for, for a long time they felt vulnerable to technology because so much technology is western but then they understood that actually uh, the west's uh, dependence on technology created a vulnerability they could exploit they could ex- exploit the the whether it's through hacking infrastructure or the openness of the media environment and social media to um, manipulate, to carry out covert activities. And what you start to see from 2014 is an uptick in hacking to steal information, but also the creation of what I call cyber illegals, which are basically a new form of false identities. But these are online. Now, they're much cheaper, faster and more disposable than the illegals of the past. You know, a Cold War illegal spent years and then decades building their cover um, a cyber legal you create in a few moments with a few clicks of a mouse but you, and, and maybe quick easier to discover but you can use them and set them into for instance u.s society to try and play on divisions uh, and use them to try and manipulate public opinion on online tech platforms so you could see how russia was quite fast at learning how to use technology and new tools to evolve its espionage and that's the, certainly one of the themes of the book is this this transition of, of russia russian espionage not being static but learning how to adapt and how to use new tools to do some of the things that it always wanted to do 
here in the United States, we are talking about this uh, a lot. Uh, you know, it comes up frequently in our in our Democratic primary debates right now. Um, it's it's in the the, the news uh, as of the last week. Um, Russia's in, involvement in in American elections and um, you know elections elsewhere. Um, in the context of your book with illegals and sleepers. Um, what was Russia doing in in those elections over the last you know four or five years? Well, one of the things I think it's worth uh, understanding is by taking that kind of sweep from the um, Cold War onwards, is to say actually there the, the, to understand that because I think one of the things Russia sees is that it it feels it was subverted by the West. It thinks it thinks that um, Western intelligence was responsible for, you know, the end of the Soviet Union, for Russia's humiliation, for um, um, sponsoring um, revolutions or the overthrow of, of, um, of, of Russia-friendly governments on its borders and even within Ru- trying to do so within Russia itself. So it's always built this narrative that it's it's under attack and therefore it should attack back. So I think that's one important element that they... They've dis- they, they, they unleashed their spies into American politics, partly because of this story they told themselves. doesn't mean it's true that the West had been um, attacking them or trying to interfere in their politics. And that's certainly one element of it. And then you see them, they'd always spied on American politics. It's kind of, that's normal, if you like, which is try and work out who's up, who's down, what, their, what a new administration's position on Russia might be. But increasingly what you saw in 2016 was an attempt to actually manipulate the political system. And that's where the ability to use these new tools, social media, cyber illegals, really come into their own, as well as being able to hack information and then leak it online and, and push it through uh, online means. Um, and it's 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 a new set of tools that Russia is able to use to follow this more aggressive path um, in its confrontation. Now, the the title of your book is "Russians Among Us." Um, uh, to what extent is is that still true today? Um, is there any insight that that there are? illegals living amongst us um, conducting this long game espionage so it's a good question because i think on the one hand russia has got new means of doing things so it's got the new means of cyber espionage of cyber illegals of false identities it's also able to use a different type of russians among us the kind of the anna chapman style russians who are um, um russians who are not hiding that they're russians but have come over as um, you know to work and to live but can be used for influence and the case of Maria Bettina is an interesting one because she was never alleged to be a trained operative of the Russian intelligence service but the claim the claim um, from the investigators was that she'd been if you like co-opted through a Russian businessman into doing things for the Russian state um, and, you know, building contacts, in her case, with the NRA, NRA, the National Rifle Association, and the right of American politics. So you can see some of these 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 new methods. But the interesting question is, do they still have these deep cover illegals? Well, you know, it's hard to know um, for sure. Uh, and, of course, you know, it's difficult to prove. But one person I did speak to from, from, from the FBI said, you know, it's so much part of Russian culture to have illegals, to want to know that they are there, uh, to, to have the kind of the prestige and the knowledge and the confidence that comes from knowing you've got them in deep cover. He thought uh, they wouldn't give up on trying to send those into the West. So perhaps somewhere out there in the suburbs, who knows, you know, there might be some of those Russian deep cover sleeper spies still among us. Uh, something interesting to ponder. For yeah, sure. and and somewhat for for someone to to find out about perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the last thing I I wanted to ask you is um, you know typically I have historians on and we're talking about something uh, in in the past. Um, mm. You know, a good analog to this is I had a gentleman on and we were talking about Donald McLean and the Cambridge Five, and the 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 research that went into that was files were declassified. Mm. Um, so I'm very interested in how you researched this book because I mean, yes, this is history, but it's not 
that far distant, and and I assume that a lot of the material related to this is still classified. So I'm I'm just curious, how does one go about researching a book like this? Yeah, and it's different from some of my previous books where you know you 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 could you were going around archives and files and able to piece together the story through that. But sometimes mm-hmm. when you're dealing with those you know, with the Second World War story, as I did previously, you've got the files, but you've got no one you can talk to <laughs> and ask questions about what was it like or or why why is why did this happen in the files? Um, when you get a bit later researching, as, as with this book, what you find is you've got less files, but more people. Um, so you have to, there's a kind of balance and a shifting, a shift in the way you do the research. There are some files and, the, and, and there, for instance, the FBI um, indictments of some of these illegals provided a really good kind of grounding of factual evidence. But then I was able to speak to some of the FBI officers who'd done the investigation and ask them questions. But of course, there were things they couldn't answer because they were still classified. And then I was able to um, go through Russian sources uh, about illegals and um, have those translated. And even in some cases, have contact with some of the illegals to ask them questions. Um, there was a limit to what they could say. And then talk to other people who'd worked around it and uh, talk to a kind of range of people. So it was perhaps more interview based rather than file based. Um, but it's still always good to have a, 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 bit, a bit of both and to play them off each other. I think in a way that's that's uh, something which, if you can do, is, is can be very productive to, to research something. Well, it, it definitely led to a, to a very, very interesting book. Um, if someone is uh, listening at home and they're uh, interested in picking up a copy of Russians Among Us uh, so they can learn more, uh, where can they go? They can go to any bookstore they like, and I'm sure online as well, but it's out now, um, and... Um, I hope those who read it get a chance to enjoy it as well. Okay. And is there anywhere they can go to learn more about you or uh, your previous work? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can follow me on Twitter at Gordon Carrera. And um, some of the other books uh, are also should still be out there, like The Art of Betrayal on MI6 and uh, Operation Columbo on the Secret Pigeon Service. And, you know, I think I think they're all very different, the books. But I think they, they also all, the common theme is to give people a kind of, realistic understanding of what espionage is and how it's changed. Well, Gordon, uh, this was a uh, fantastic discussion. Um, Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Great. Well, I really enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Thank you to our guest today, Gordon Carrera, for coming on the program. And if this topic of espionage interests you, If you look down in the description of this episode in your podcast app, you will find a link to Gordon's book, Russians Among Us. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Again, I'll ask you if you did to please leave a review on wherever you listen to your podcasts. Look for the show on Twitter and Instagram, both of which are at CMTU History. I am active on both just about every day, and I would love to hear from you and interact a little bit. All right, please join me here next time where we will be talking about female spies in Europe during World War II. See you then. This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com.